I'd like to um, start by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, um, pay my respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people past and present, and I acknowledge their contribution um, to this place and to this institution. Yeah, yeah. Um, my name's Anne Evans, I'm the Associate Dean of um, Research in the College of Arts and Social Sciences. Um, and a couple of years ago, CAS started this inaugural professorial lecture series uh, as an opportunity for us as a community to welcome and to celebrate new prof professorial appointments to our college. So today we celebrate the promotion of Professor Mark Oxenham um, from, from the School of Archaeology and Anthropology in the Research School of Humanities and the Arts. So Mark... Um, trained at Child, what, what was then called Northern Territory University, now Charles Darwin University, in bioanthropology and archaeology. Um, and he was awarded his PhD in 2001. He's held teaching and research posi positions in the US at, at Colorado College and at the ANU. So he has been president of the Australasian Society of Human Biology. He um, has been an Australian Future Fellow. Um, he was elected the a Fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London and elected a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities in, in 2016. Um, since 2009, Mark has acted as a consultant for the Unrecovered War Casualties Unit of the Australian Department of Defence, in, in which capacity he has searched for, recovered and identified Defence Force personnel from conflicts ranging from World War I to the Vietnam War, in France, Vietnam, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, and Northern Australia. I understand you're off to Papua New Guinea um, in, in a few minutes' time. Yes. So um, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Oxenham. Thank you. I had my own um, welcome to country slide um, as well prepared, so I'd like to do that. Um, and I'd also like to point out that um, this is although some of you might not know it, um, the International Day of Worlds Indigenous Peoples, which is um, somewhat relevant given my talk. I'm not talking about um, Indigenous Australians, but I am talking about um, ancient Indigenous people um, in Southeast Asia. That is the, the focus of the talk. Now, there are images of human remains. Um, these are skeletonised remains for the most part. Um, and these are remains of ancient um, indigenous people that lived in what is now geopolitically known as um, Northern Vietnam. So if anyone has issue with that, um, you might not want to stay. Now, one of the key words in my talk is complexity. Um, I'm not going to come up with an, uh, an answer what is complexity at the end of this talk. Um, but I want you to consider this concept of complexity um, whilst I um, go through this presentation, um, particularly in an archaeological sense, what is um, complexity, because you know, basically I'm an archaeologist that looks at human um, remains and tries to um, um, develop narratives based on those remains. Um, so some of the things I want you to think about complexity in an archaeological sense is com um, complex behaviour is an absolute or is it relative to something um, before or after. One of the other major themes here is farming and hunter-gatherers. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about these um, quite a lot, um, particularly the, the hunter-gatherer side of it. So um, is complexity something we only see with the emergence of farming? And there's a whole range of things associated with the emergence of farming that I'll talk about, um, and then I'll juxtapose that with some of the things that um, we see emerging with complex hunter-gatherers um, in northern Southeast Asia. You know, so are farmers and are hunter-gatherer cultures, are they fundamentally different or do they have more in common than we think? And, and that's the, the sort of spoiler, okay? So that's what I'm on about in this talk today. And, you know, along that theme of, of relativity, if you like, I mean, you know, there are things that have happened um, in human and pre-human antiquity that seem to suggest, you know, sudden punctuations in, you know, the normal day-to-day um, -day scheme of things. And one of these is, is tool manufacture. You know, we have um, physical evidence for stone tools at least two and a half million years ago. Um, obviously, 
not by people that would necessarily classify as human, but certainly belonging to our greater um, family. And if some reports are to be believed, maybe even a million years earlier, we have evidence for the use of those tools, if not the tools um, themselves. So, you know, that's an incredible sort of antiquity we're talking about there. Controlled use of fire. Again, before we are really on the stage, you know, nearly one and a half million years ago, you know, another indicator of complexity relative to what went on before. Art, a bit controversial, but we've had, and as you saw on my um, leading slide there, that was um, um, a representation of art from um, Sulawesi that's been dated to nearly 40,000 um, years ago. So again, as compared to what went before, you know, a sudden punctuation in, in the equilibrium um, of things, if you like. Um, deliberate burial is a little bit controversial, but um, at least around about the same age, around 40 odd thousand years. And then domestication, and this comes into the farming versus hunter gatherer theme I'm talking about. For the most part, domestication seems to kick in around 10,000 years ago, although there are things like dogs that were probably um, domesticated um, much earlier with hunter gatherer um, populations. So these are some things I want you to think about, you know, this relative nature of complexity. So I want to set the scene here. I'm interested in, um, in Northern Southeast Asia, so I'm going to introduce you to half the world. So this is my version of the population history of, of this part of the world. Um, there's basically a, a two-pronged um, event. There's the emergence of anatomically modern humans, which um, a recent Nature paper suggests may go back as far as 200,000 years ago, but we've fairly clear evidence for them emerging out of Africa somewhere between 80 and 120,000 years. The recent um, dates in northern Australia would suggest that um, modern humans made it here 65,000 years ago, so I updated my slide here to put circa 70,000 um, years. It doesn't really matter, it does, that early date doesn't really affect um, much, although it is interesting that I've, put, I've listed a range of, of sites here with um, the earliest known evidence of modern humans. And in Cambodia, Dampaling around 50 odd thousand years ago, um, Tabon in um, Palawan Island in the Philippines around 47 thousand years ago, um, Tien Yuen up in um, near the, where the Joe Codian um, Homo erectus material was found um, nearly 40 thousand years ago. The Deep Skull in Borneo, um, 37,000 years ago. Wadjuk, somewhere between um, 28 and 30,000 years. So, you know, there's a lot of early stuff, but we haven't found any sites or fossil evidence approaching the 65,000 years in Southeast Asia. But we should, because this is where the first Australians came from. There's nowhere else for them to come from. They had to have come through this um, region. Things are a lot... Um, a lot later um, through the northern route, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, and the fossil evidence is a bit spotty. I mean, I've got Denisovan Cave up there more of a reference point than anything else, because that's clearly not an anatomically modern human. Um, but it just shows you, you know, we've, we've got a few scattered fossils, the earliest about 45,000 years. Not enough bone there to really tell us much, but ancient DNA stuff has suggests these are anatomically modern humans. They're also associated with a particular toolkit, the Upper Paleolithic or Early Upper Paleolithic toolkit. Um, and there's a lot of that material culture going on, which supports the idea of the date when they're coming in through the north. We don't really have an equivalent toolkit um, in Southeast Asia, except maybe edge grinding technology, which is very, very early. Um, very early dates in Australia and also very early dates up, if, if you believe it, up to 30 or 40,000 years ago um, in Japan, that edge grinding technology. Now, these things are shaped by climate, which is a, another theme that I'm talking about. In the north, this, this graph down the bottom there is measured in hundreds of thousands of years, so over the far right is 200,000 years ago. Um, and coming towards the left, you see that big dip, that's 20,000 years ago. That's the last glacial maximum. So this colonisation of the north couldn't have happened at many periods in prehistory. But around about 45,000 years ago, we have the marine isotope stage three, which is a warming event, which would allow colonisation of that part of the world then. 
Now, as far as the south goes, it's not a big deal. It would have been relatively warm anyway. There's, there's no barriers, but the landscape would have been a very different back then. So if we look at these two maps, on the far right is what our part of the world would have looked like from around 50 odd thousand years ago to about 20 odd thousand years ago. So that's the landscape that the first modern people in our part of the world would have experienced. Okay, it's very different to the modern landscape. So on the left, this is where we are now in a major warming event. And on the right, this is when it was really, really, really um, cold. So obviously climate would have had an effect on what the first people would have encountered. And in fact, most of the sites where the first people would have been um, living, which is coastal for the most part, are long since gone, which is problematic for archaeology. Okay, hunter-gatherers. This is a talk where I want to suggest hunter-gatherers rule. So it's about hunter-gatherers. This, this is my focus. Um, now, they've been kicking around the region for at least 70,000 years. Okay? But something happens roughly seven or 8,000 years ago where this blue ellipse is, um, which is modern-day southern China, Guangxi, Guangdong province, and, and northern Vietnam. Um, in this whole region, okay, something interesting happens, and this is what I'm going to focus on. Now, and this is where the complex hunter-gatherers that I'm going to talk about, and I'll, I'll sort of define that as I go through the talk. This is where these guys are operating. These little pictures, icons, represent the modern-day descendants of the original people in these particular areas. Okay? We don't really know a lot about the what the first people in this part of the world looked like. It's very, very hard to tap into. But we know what their descendants some 70 odd thousand years ago looked like. And that's why I'm using these to, to, to help um, you focus what I'm talking about in terms of farmers and hunter-gatherers. So hunter-gatherers look like the guy next to the blue ellipse and the farmers look like the um, girl next to the yellow um, ellipse. Now these complex hunter-gatherers had a significant presence in this part of the world from about seven or 8,000 years ago till about four or 5,000 years ago, which seems to coincide with the end of a particular warming event, which is many, many different names, but um, you know, the Holocene Thermal Maximum or the, you know, whatever. There was a, a, a major warming event occurring um, and maximizing somewhere between eight or 9,000 years ago and four or 5,000 years ago, okay? which coincides with the presence of these complex hunter-gatherers. At a similar time, we get the rise of agriculturalists, or the rise of the Neolithic, as it's often called in archaeology, where you've got domesticated plants. The more northerly yellow ellipses, where we get millet in the Yellow River, and the more southerly um, yellow ellipses centres on the um, um, Yangtze River basins, where we get the domestication of rice. Okay? Now, there's very early domestication of rice and, and other animals such as pigs going on in this part of the world, you know, roughly 9,000 years ago, but these guys are not dependent on farming at all until several millennia later. They're essentially hunter-gatherers that just so happen to have domesticated stuff, okay? That's something to be aware of. They become dependent on farming roughly towards the end of this warming event. Roughly towards the end of this warming event is where our complex hunter-gatherers disappear. So there's something potentially interesting going on there. But why the why the big deal about farming? You know, as I was suggesting, we think about complexity and, and punctuations and some sort of status quo or equilibrium um, going through time. You know, a lot of people turn to farming or domestication of stuff, domestication of animals, um, domestication of plants, and our dependency on that is a massively big deal. You know, the foundations of civilization, okay, is what farming led to. And if we didn't have farming, we didn't have civilization. That's the sort of big deal a lot of people um, couch this um, issue in, or the way they think about it. Okay? Now, if farming's such a big deal, why am I interested in complex hunter-gatherers um, who came into existence, you know, roughly the same time as domestication was occurring um, in East Asia? 
And also, why my interest in hunter-gatherers is given that they've been kicking around in this part of the world for 70,000 years, and in fact, right from the time where we have our first stone tools or evidence of stone tool use millions of years ago, these guys were hunting and gathering, okay? So why is it such a big deal? Well, hopefully I'm going to tell you. Okay, what did farming ever give to us? And then after we think about this, let's think about what complex hunter-gatherers gave to us. Now, there are pros and there are cons, okay? Most farming activities, early farming activities, are assumed to be associated with sedentism or staying put in one place for the most part. We had dependable plant and animal resources. There was the ability to have food surpluses, which could be put aside for lean years or um, when there were droughts or when a plague of locusts came through. But also we could use surpluses to pay for people to do other things to free them up from the necessity of um, creating their own food. So then we can get craft specialisation going on. And again, with, with farming, there's the idea, this is, a, this is a, the, the beginnings of social differentiation and, and hierarchy, okay? So all the things that lead to civilization and the greatness that civilization is. Now, there are cons. We, we invariably get increases in population. The birth spacing you know, for individual mothers decreases. They end up by having more children's populations grow. And then, of course, there are all the issues associated with um, limited resources and with population growth. There's arguably decreased dietary bread. So they're eating, you know, they've got their wheat crop or their rice crop or whatever, but they don't have the breadth of plant resources they may have had during their hunter-gatherer years or the time to go out and hunt or search for the breads of protein sources that they would have had as a hunter-gatherer. And there's an increase in, in animal-borne diseases. When you interact with animals, domesticated animals, there's an increase in um, a whole range of diseases associated with that. And in general, from many parts of the world where you look at it, the adoption of agriculture has led to relatively poor health compared to previous periods. So there are pros and there are cons. So, you know, presumably, um, hunting and gathering is going to be quite different. It's not going to have those same pros and so cons because these are hunter-gatherers and they're very different and they aren't the basis of, you know, civilization. So what characterises these complex hunter-gatherers I've been talking about and what makes them so distinct to their revolutionary or progressive farmers? So here's a case study. This is a site I've been working on for a while. In fact, I worked on material from the site for my PhD that had been excavated back <clears throat> in the late 70s and early um, 80s. And I went back and did a text excavation several years ago and then um, put in a, um, a, a massive trench, 12 by 8, I think it was, um, back in 2013. It's basically situated on the periphery of that um, hunter -gatherer, complex hunter-gatherer zone um, in northern Vietnam. These particular guys, Kong Kong Moor is a site, they're believed to have emerged, they must have come from somewhere, and we know there were hunter-gatherers in the region. Um, most of the hunter-gatherers in Southeast Asia are blanketed under the term of Hoabinian, um, which suggests that there's not much differentiation going on, but there, there certainly was. These guys from Kong Kong Moor seem to have emerged from um, a series of communities that developed from the Hoabinian and can be characterised in, um, as a separate entity as compared to the hunter-gatherer entities that had occurred for the last 60-odd um, thousand years by the fact that they had edge-grinding technology, um, edge-ground stone implements, um, and they had pottery. So the earliest pottery in, in Vietnam is, is nearly 9,000 um, years old. Now, pottery is a characteristic of farmers in many parts of the world, not everywhere, but in many parts of the world. And when I talk about farmers, I'm talking about people who are farming domesticated animals and domesticated um, crops here. But what do you do with pottery normally? I mean, you can put fl flowers in it these days and you can, you can decorate your kitchen, but what do you do with pottery? Why is pottery useful? Because you can store stuff in it. You know, you can even make beer in it. Which is maybe what some of these people were doing. So it's something you can use to store stuff. On the right-hand side there, we got over 300 kilos of pottery from our 
um, hunter-gatherer site. Pottery was important to them, okay? Presumably, they were using pottery the same way most people use pottery, and they were storing stuff. But why would hunter-gatherers be storing stuff? Isn't that a limiting... If you're mobile... And this is the other thing about hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers have to be mobile. If you're not mobile, you're not a hunter-gatherer, okay? But these guys had a lot of pottery, and some of these pots, a 30 centimetre diameter pots, are really large pots. They're not things you can just sling a bunch of them on your back and traipse around the landscape. It suggests sedentary behaviour. It suggests they were storing stuff, maybe for, you know, later on, or maybe they're storing stuff so they can um, use those stored surpluses to allow other people to engage in specialised activities. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But pottery has been around for a very long time in East Asia. It's not like Europe where pottery emerges at the same time as farming in Europe. In Southeast Asia, pottery existed for you know, at least 10,000 years before anyone thought of domesticating anything. OK, this is northern Vietnam. That um, square there is on the southern part of the Red River Delta, so just south of um, modern-day Hanoi. Um, there are about 16 of these hunter-gatherer sites in here. So there's a lot of them. This is a picture of a part of my one where if, if I add the... And we put our square next to the 1979-80 square. Um, we've got over 266 individuals in the site, and I don't think I've excavated 10% of the site. This is a massive site. There's lots of people living here, and there's lots of these sites around. This is not what you typically associate with normal hunter-gatherers. It suggests some sort of demographic expansions going on, population growth. Now, another thing that, um, well, in Europe, again, well, that's probably not a very good analogy, one of the characteristics of the Neolithic in Europe was the introduction of edge grinding technology. But we know we've had edge grinding technology in our part of the world for probably 50, if not more, thousand years. Okay? But the thing is, they had sophisticated tools. They had tiny little adzes this big for fine work, and they had massive things that were probably hafted for God knows what, hollowing out tree trunks, making canoes, chopping down trees. I don't know. Why do you need an axe that big if you're a hunter-gatherer? Seriously, there's something else you've got to cart around the landscape with you. They had fine bone tools, and this is um, um, Rebecca James has done a lot of work on these bone tools. Um, again, something that farmers had, but hunter gatherers have them as well. So they're not, they don't lack sophistication in their toolkit at all. They also had ornamentation. This is very, very rare in this particular site, but this is um, someone's wrist bone. Wrapped around the wrist bone is this bracelet, and the bracelet is made from um, the incisors of a porcupine, which continuously grow, and they've fashioned this into a bracelet, and it's been worked. Let's turn to food. Okay, I've shown sophistication in, in a range of um, areas that are comparable to um, between farmers and complex hunter-gatherers, but what about food? Surely, with, if, you know, if you're going to engage in sedentary behaviour, if you're sedentary and you've got population growth going on and you've got sites popping up all over the place, surely you must have had a reliable source of food. Now, farmers can lay claim to that. Okay? We've... We've engaged in techniques called flotation, which allows you to find tiny, minute plant fossils in, in your site. And we have found plants like canarium, which you can still buy today, and a lot of people eat them. They're high in proteins, fats, enzymes, you know, all sorts of things. So they're a, they're a great staple. There's a lot of canarium all around the landscape. But the next question is, okay, but yeah, hunter-gatherers, of course they collect stuff, so Sure, you're going to find canarium and, and other nuts and, and remains of tubers if you've got good preservation in your site. But are they cultivating? In other words, are they managing these wild plants? So cultivating is just managing wild plants, which could be as simple as weeding something or pulling out a, um, you know, a, a banana shoot from one place and putting it in another or tending a grove of sago trees or whatever. It's just managing stuff, okay? We've got a number of sites in southern China which have evidence for all of these types of things. You know, things like wild bananas, 
um, with giant seeds inside them. Jobs ears, um, water chestnuts, sago. Okay, so there is evidence, not necessarily just from my site, but from a number of these sites in the region, that they may well have been cultivating or managing wild resources, so these were reliable. And it would also suggest that they would have to stay put as well. You can't, you know, well, you can plant your sago tree and disappear and come back, but a lot of these things, you need to look after them. What about animals? And this is a lot of stuff Rebecca Jones has been working on identifying all the animals we have. And we've got a lot of animals, which you would expect in a hunter-gatherer site. Okay, we've got really weird animals like pangolins. We've got other things like fish, sharks, rays, goannas, range of turtles, monkeys, and, and what have you. Cute little otters. I don't know who would want to eat them. We've got deer. We've got these guys. I don't know if they were necessarily hunting them. I think we've only got one, haven't we? So we know a lot. But... Um, when you crunch the numbers, they're focusing on these water buff or wild cattle, cattle. Most of the protein, animal protein they're getting, are these big animals. Okay? So again, you think, well, yeah, okay, they're hunter-gatherers. They're going to go out and find big animals. What, what's the big deal? Are they managing these animals? Can I make an argument that they are interacting with these wild animals in a way that suggests some sort of management of them. Now, there's a couple of lines of evidence for this. This is very, very difficult to do archaeologically to demonstrate that someone is managing wild animals because they're wild. If they were domesticated, you would go, well, yeah, okay, fine. You, you must have been managing them because they're domesticated. But when they're wild, it doesn't, doesn't work, you know. So we've looked at a range of things. Now, one of the things that occurs in our site is a very high level of serious trauma. Okay, so this person was whacked on the head by something fairly large and hard. And this is perimortem, so it occurred around the time of death. They died from this, probably subdural hematoma, and, and they died. Okay, this is serious concussion, followed by death. What caused this? I don't know, but I like to think it looks uncannily like the shape of a water buffalo's hoof. <laughs> anyway, this is my only evidence. We've got between 7 and 10% of the adults have serious trauma. They've got broken arms that have snapped and then they've joined them back together and then they've overlapped and shortened the limb. It's the same with the legs. This poor individual here, an elderly female, has had a crushing injury to a foot. Okay, it's fused some of the bones together, and at the same time, it's amputated some of her toes. Maybe she was trodden on by a giant water buffalo. I don't know. The thing is, in this landscape that these people are living in, there's, there's not a lot of really dangerous things going on. Unless people were deliberately climbing up cliff faces and throwing themselves off, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of you know, opportunity to hurt yourself, okay? Look at this individual. Two broken arms and a broken leg. And again, we're talking about this broken leg here. This person's shin has broken, overlapped, and then healed, okay? Now, I don't focus on this in this lecture, but we have so much of these broken bones going on in the site that it suggests that they must have actually had some sort of sophistication and medical intervention as well, okay? But anyway, that's another story. I've got enough sophisticated stuff without bringing that in. But the idea is that these are very serious injuries. There's not really any opportunity in the landscape as it is to, to you know, develop these types of injuries. Are these injuries consistent with getting in close to large animals when you're trying to manage them in some way? Okay? Is it? Possibly. But we need more evidence. Ta-da! I couldn't believe it when we found on this, this, um, these bits of cystic material. It, it's something that's roughly this big. Okay, it's the size of a golf ball, basically. It's a calcified, hydatid cyst associated with a burial on our site. Now, in hydatid disease, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second, one of the outcomes of it is the development of these cysts within your soft tissue particularly like saliva, okay? 
We've got a lot of skeletal lesions, these types of things here, which are, and under um, X-ray, are consistent with hydatid cysts that love these highly vascularized parts of your long bones. We've got a lot of this stuff going on. These people had rampant hydatid disease. Okay? To have hydatid disease, normally you need something like this, some cattle or sheep. They didn't have sheep, but we've got cattle. And often you need a dog of some form. Modern days, you know, I mean, hydatid disease was a big thing in Australia and, and um, New Zealand in the 60s and 70s until they stopped farmers from giving their dogs um, raw offal. They can then stop the life cycle of it. Okay, but typically you need a dog and it can be a wild one and we have these wild dogs. Rebecca's identified them in our site. We've got these cattle and of course we've got humans. Okay, you don't get rampant hydatid disease in a population in these days or in any case I've heard of unless you're a pastoralist or a farmer. Okay, you need to have a really intimate relationship with a cattle. So add this to the trauma and the fact that they're targeting these types of animals, I think there's a good argument here that they may well have been managing these cattle. Okay? So apart from the fact that they've got pottery and they could have had surfaces, um, surpluses, they had sophisticated tools and ornamentation, just like our farmers. They had reliable, potentially cultivated plants, sources, reliable, potentially managed cattle sources, resources. They had nasty infectious diseases, so they were just like the farmers. Okay, there was nothing different going on there. Elevated levels of fertility, population increases. So what's the difference between the farmers and the hunter-gatherers here? Okay, it must be. Clearly, these guys didn't have complex belief systems. How do we look at complex belief systems from an archaeological perspective? We look at the way they bury their dead, the way they treated their dead. So surely if we look at how they treated their dead, we're going to see it was totally different and simplistic compared to hunter-gatherers. We've got to find a difference somewhere. Okay, the, the two top um, burials here, the, the left and, and the right, are examples of burial treatment um, in these sites, all through northern Vietnam and southern China. We, we call it flexed, so you know they're, they're tightly pulled together in various ways. This one is like fetal flexed, so the, the knees are brought up to the chest and, and the elbows are like this lying on the side, just like a little baby would be sleeping, right? This individual, although it might not look like it at the moment, is squatting down. The head's obviously moved, but they're squatting down, okay? Except for that bracelet I showed you, that incisor, porcupine incisor bracelet, they don't have anything in their graves. So they're, you know, pauper graves, if you like. Let's have a look at, this is a site which is a stone's throw away, literally, um, but several thousand years later, an early farming um, site in northern Vietnam. This is how they buried their dead, with lots and lots of grave goods. Okay? And evidence for some sort of social differentiation. Some people had more grave goods, some people had less. Okay? So there may have been elites and, and non-elites going on. Okay? When, when you look at this particular burial, there's also evidence, which I don't have time to go into now, to suggest that this burial, even though it's nearly 4,000 years old, was originally coffined. So, you know, a lot of energy was expended to create a large coffin to put this individual in, to put all these pots around, and you can just make out these bracelets. These are beautiful, fine, jade bracelets. Okay? So there's no doubting that the the quality of the ornamentation is, is a, a higher order of magnitude. But we would be absolutely and totally wrong to suspect that there weren't highly complex, ritualised mortuary behaviours associated with these complex hunter-gatherers. I believe we have funerary specialists involved here. There's something that we're loosely referring to as mutilation of the corpses going on. Roughly 70% of the adults are mutilated in a highly systematic manner. We believe the bodies are laid out. Someone's using one of these giant edge ground um, axes. 
and they're chopping the body, not at the joints, but in the mid shaft of the upper arms, in the insides of the thighs, um, in the outsides of the shins. Sometimes they're removing the heads. Sometimes they're chopping the collarbones as well. Okay? It's highly systematic. Sometimes we're getting probable rearrangement of the head going on and other things placed where the um, head was. We can tell from these chops, so this is, this is um, a thigh bone. On the right hand side, with the um, piece that's been detached through the chopping put back, and this is just to show you it separate, this indicates that this chopping was done when the person was fully fleshed. Okay? But after death, well hopefully after death, what are they doing next? Okay, after they've ritually chopped the body and maybe removed the head and whatnot, they're bringing it to be together in this tight position, either a, a flexed, fetal flexed one or a, a squatting position. They're binding it. We think they may be using bark cloth, although we can't prove that. Okay, now there's complex arguments for why we think that. Um, they're inserting them into circular pits, and you can see one of these circular pits here. This is all dirt going on, but this is the dirt that's been refilled, and you can actually see the person's knees popping out there because that's a, a squatting one. We think because sometimes the bodies fall in various directions, but they maintain their integrity, that they may be putting basketry in there. So there may well be grave goods, but we can't see them because they're decomposed. Okay, so perishable um, grave goods. And then for the most part, the place squatting facing the rising sun with a little bit of variation that probably has to do with the seasonal variation and where the sun rises, okay, from summer to winter. I'll put these two guys over here just to give you an indication of how this sort of wrapping would go. This one indicates that we also think the head was covered, unlike this where the, the skull's um, exposed. So these Peruvian mummies are only there to illustrate how I think it's, they may have been wrapped. So this is highly complex behavior arguably even more complex than the, the farmer's mortuary behaviour we know of early farmers um, in the region. I think we can say we have similar levels of complexity, no matter how we look at it, going on between these early farmers and these complex hunter-gatherer groups in this part of the world. This is what I'm leaning towards. These are just, you know, what we're looking at. We're not looking at some sort of developmental chain or some sort of progressive chain. We're just looking at alternative responses to what's going on at the time. And we know what was going on at the time. Around eight or 9,000 years ago, there was a massive warming event. And then about four or 5,000 years ago, there was a cooling event, okay? So these are the main environmental things that's going on. But why did, if, if, if these hunter-gatherers are as equally complex um, as the farmers, why did they disappear? Why are the farmers still with us? Was farming a better option? This is a slide that I showed you at the beginning, looking at this, um, this um, climate change um, graph up the top here. That thick red line represents that optimal um, period of warming, after which it drops down. They disappear when it starts to get cold. They rose when it started to get warm, they disappear when it started to get cold. By three and a half thousand years ago, farmers have taken over the whole region. Now it's not this simple, and I'll show you another slide in a second to demonstrate that, but for the most part, these guys are gone. They've disappeared. Their signature has disappeared. A lot of things could have happened with cooling. Okay, they, they could have been, you know, I'm suggesting that they're relying on unmanaged cattle, wild cattle, that are relying on managed wild plants. Cooling could have totally disrupted that system, totally. Okay, and it could have put them under an enormous amount of stress. Okay? Then we have these migrations of new farmers coming into the region. And we know there's an archaeological signature of them moving into the region. Okay? So they got this double whammy. This is a site here that I worked on um, several years ago, back in 2005 and then again in 2007. It's a really interesting site. It's a smoking gun an archaeological smoking gun. It's situated where that red dot is. As I said, a stone's throw away from um, the hunter-gatherer site I've been using as a case study to illustrate 
you know, complex hunter-gatherers throughout the region. I'm using my little people again, the little icons, to suggest what the population makeup would have been. Now, if we go back to this previous slide, it suggested that they're all modern East Asian looking farmers. No. A lot of these sites are dated, I'm using BC on this, I should have standardised it for before present, but just add a couple of thousand years and you'll know how many years ago. But they range in age from nearly 4,000 years ago to um, this site here, smack in the middle of Cambodia, um, which is maybe 13 or 1400 years old. If the East Asian person is in front, it means a dominant genetic contribution is East Asian, but there's still a residual indigenous signature going on. If they're next to each other, it means half-half. If one is, as in Pom Snai, the Cambodian one, which is really interesting because it's very late, there's still a very strong indigenous presence there. So what I'm saying is that, yeah, these farmers came pouring down, but there was a lot of genetic interaction going on. Okay, a lot. Some sites more than others. And Mun Buck, when these are just um, fancy schematics to sort of differentiate between populations based on, you know, whatever set of criteria you're interested in, you might be measuring the head or looking at the teeth or whatever. It's a proxy for genetic distance. But our mum buck, we have people that look like this, and people that look like this, and people that look like a combination of the two, and they're all treated the same. Although in, in some circumstances where we have elite burials, guess who the elites are? This is one of our elite. These guys are the elites, not the new incoming farmers. So these hunter-gatherers didn't disappear. They're potentially still with us. Okay, so conclusions. In the first slides I showed you, you know, these early population movements were clearly um, influenced by major climate events, such as um, you know, the, the northern um, colonisation of Siberia couldn't have occurred until marine isotope stage three when there was a massive warming event and allowed them to move into that area. The southern route would have been fine regardless of what um, period of the glaciation we were in, but we know the coastline was a hell of a lot different back then than it is, is today. Okay, so that would have been a totally different environment back then. Um, more recent minor climate um, events, such as that one that started around eight or 9,000 years ago and finished four or 5,000 years ago. I say minor, we're talking about one to four degrees increase in temperature wherever you are, and between 50 and 100% increase in precipitation, depending on where you are. So minor, that's actually quite, quite significant. Um, that mini climate change event seems to coincide um, with the emergence of both farming and complex hunter-gathering. These hunter-gatherers are as sophisticated, as complex, however measured, than their um, relative farmers or neighbouring farmers. Farmers and hunter-gatherers have clearly adapted in their own ways to the environment, what they've had to deal with. We see these hunter-gatherers start to disappear when the climate starts to cool again. But, as I've just said, they didn't totally disappear. They're actually still with us and they have a very strong genetic signature still within Southeast Asia. What about the future? This is my last slide. Just remember the slide I, I threw up there. On the right-hand side, this was the situation from you know, 50, 60,000 years ago until 20,000 years. This is the situation um, today. So we're roughly on this graph here. This is a different scale here. We're looking at centuries here. The 21st century, we're about here. This is a predicted climate modeling. I don't know. I was trying to search for some maps to see how much land mass we're going to lose in the next several centuries. This is how much we lost, <coughs> how much we gained during the last glacial maximum when all of that seawater was locked up in ice sheets. This is where we are now and we've got, you know, we've got predicted climate change 
similar to this um, Holocene event where we've got one to four degree um, increases in temperature and obviously precipitation is going to depend on what part of the world you're going to be in. But I definitely know for some parts of Southeast Asia, well, most of this part where the Mekong is and much of southern Vietnam and Cambodia is going to disappear and there's quite a few other areas around here. And I think Australia is fairly safe for the most part, although this is very low-lying around here. But much of this area, well, it's only fit to South Australians, <laughs> that's going to disappear. It's about 25% of Australian land mass is predicted to, to disappear. But that's a significant amount of land mass, particularly if it's the land mass that we're living Australia. on. Yeah, that's not the prime area yeah. in particular. So, in the past, we are dealing with relatively small populations. Our complex hunter-gatherers and our farmers are relatively small populations. You know, they can adapt to changes in climate, although ultimately our complex hunter-gatherers didn't. Okay? But it wasn't only climate change that dealt them a final blow. It was massive demographic expansion from the north of them that, you know, um, was the final straw. I guess the, the question is... When we're not, well, I mean, we're totally dependent on farming now. Most of us wouldn't consider ourselves to be farmers. I think if anything, if you think about it, we, what do we, how do we get most of our food? We go into the supermarket, so we're foragers. Okay? We're not hunter-gatherers. We're hunter-foragers, we're foragers, okay? Are we flexible enough to deal with what's coming? I don't know. I'm an archeologist. I only deal with stuff that happened in the past. Okay, thank you.